here in uh, Denver, Colorado. Yep. Uh, we just got in here on a red eye, and we're all kind of like, you know, I've been. We were filming in Baja for a while, and we came out here. We're out here for a very cool event. You know, you're gonna, probably going to check it out later. But uh, while I was here, I'd figured why not stop by and visit one of my friends. Uh, and also one of the knife companies that I kind of, you know, we we work we've been working together for a while. Uh, Want to introduce yourself to sure. our uh, audience? Hey everyone, I'm John Palazzis, um, Copus Designs. Been doing it for about I don't know eight years now or so. Uh, met Ed six seven years ago. Uh, USN. Yeah, yeah, we met at the uh, so the USN show is probably the premier custom knife kind of show in uh, in, in in the U.S. It's a uh, it's in Vegas. Yep. Uh, everything on the tables there is worth a, a lot of money. That's yeah, more I, than I can afford, for sure. Even then, I, think, I, I was like, this is insane. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, one of our friends uh, runs uh, part of it, uh, Jer, uh, yep. uh, Lindsay. I remember flipping a $12,000 butterfly knife there. <laughs> there, were, the guys, there like, were like kids, like 15-year-old kids coming up to the table and like hand you something. And I'd be like, oh, this is like really cool. Like it was very nice. But then they're like, yeah, 5,000 bucks. And I was like, get the that way yeah. for me. Like I don't need that. Uh, which, you know, will lead us into some of the work we're, like we're doing uh, together and kind of how we're kind of stepping away from some of that. Yeah. But uh, your work has, uh, has always ca captured my attention as far as uh, some of the attention to detail and the thought process and know-how that you kind of put behind things. Not only as a maker, I know you've apprenticed under some pretty... Yeah. Some pretty Matt new. Martin from Vehement Knives, apprenticed for about three years before he moved to Michigan. That's kind of how Copus came to be about. And uh, when we met, I was actually still apprenticing with Matt. And then um, I think basically what happened was you came to the table and hung out. It was super cool. I actually didn't know who you were. And someone came over and was like, you know who that was, right? And I was like, no. Oh, and they were like, oh, it's Ed Calderon. And I was like, okay. Like... It was really nice, and they're like, "Oh, really? Like, yeah, hey, you should like talk to him." And I was like, "Okay, cool." So then a year went by, and you were coming to Colorado to teach a class, and um, for whatever reason, the class fell through, and I think that we talked, and I was like, "Hey, like, remember we met at USN, and then we'd actually met at Blade Show since then too." Yeah. So we'd met twice at that point. And I was like, uh, are you still free that weekend? You were like, yeah. I was like, well, we'd be down to host you. And that's kind of where it all started, right? Yeah. It was like USN, Blade Show, and then you came out to Denver and we did our first organic Man, mediums. I, I, I walk around a lot of knife shows and like, you know, when I'm at the when I'm, I'm at Blade Show, I usually you know buy stuff from like Fred Parrott. You know, yeah, always, like, always, always, every single time. <laughs> Dave and I go, my brother. Like we've every single time it's a tradition, we always buy from Fred. And, and the, the reason is like he makes some weird shit, and you'll never and see it again. You'll never see it again. Yeah. He makes one off stuff. Uh, but like I try and always stop by different makers, see different people's work. I am no, I'm not a snob, but you know, every now and like specifically when I look at a knife or when I look at anything like that, I grew up on a pig farm. Uh, I learned how to peel rattlesnake skins off with a knife from my mom. My mom always carried a knife. Yep. So uh, the, the concept of having a knife that is something you meant to work with and carry and use every day. So I remember like stopping off different tables and I stopped off at your table and uh, the size, I remember I, I kind of gravitated towards certain specific sizes. I, I don't like big knives, I just like small knives that I can carry with me that are, that are comfortable to carry basically. And I remember like, telling you like, oh, this one's pretty cool. I like the orientation, I like the blade uh, design on this. And uh, every now and then some people get nervous when I stop by their table. But it's Luckily not, I didn't like, know who you were at it's the time, fine. so it was like, that made it great, and now I do. It's like, a, it's like I feel like the uh, critic from Ratatouille every now and then, like, <laughs> walking around. Uh, but uh, I remember seeing your work and see, that's cool, you know? Uh, we started doing classes together. Uh, basically, you started uh, being our kind of uh, host here, our the home. The Denver go-to, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I remember uh, I was on my, uh, my way out, flying back, and I had an incident on the plane. Yeah. Uh, idiot went into the, uh, the bathroom on the plane on my way flying out, uh, vaped a, uh, with a vape yeah, pen, set off the alarm. Uh, then he started getting into it with the flight attendant, right? He tried to push the flight attendant next to it, like, uh, out of the way, and I, like, grabbed the, the guy, and it was a whole thing. I had to talk to the police. It was a whole thing. And during a snowstorm. During a snowstorm. During storm. a snowstorm. So, was, uh, so they, I missed the flight. We had to, I had to give a statement. Uh, I was put on another, another flight, and while I was here, 
in the middle of the night and said, hey, you want to you wanna hang out yeah. a little bit? <laughs> it was literally like midnight, I think. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, you and Morgan showed up. Yeah. Uh, and, At the uh, hotel in the middle uh, of a snowstorm. Yeah. And I told you, hey, you make some pretty high quality shit, and that's cool, and that's amazing. Can we figure out how to make a lower budget Elvia? No. Like, when I say lower budget, I mean not, not that. Affordable. Something that like still has all the qualities and quant like it was ba basically we can make in a way that people can access. Yeah. So it's not like only the elite or the people that are watching all the time can get that knife. Yeah. So something that was accessible. So I told uh, my, my only uh, like requirements is has to be small, injection molded handle, and uh, functional. Yeah. And uh, that's where we kind of started our relationship yeah. to kind of build that up. But yeah, we were just talking earlier. Like I was trying, I, I have the napkin sketch somewhere. And I know Morgan has the picture of us working at the table, sketching it out. And like, I can't believe like how long that was. I think that that must have been like four, four or years? five years ago. Yeah, four yeah. years ago maybe. Yeah, because we uh, had done a few classes by then, but we, that was the first thing we did together. And every prototype you would send, I was like, hey, Ed, here's a new prototype, cool. Grab it from you, and there's a pig carcass hanging somewhere. <laughs> start fucking, we start working with it. Not only that, but also actually, uh, I sent it off to a friend who's a chef. Yep. And he started, uh, you know, carrying it and processing things with it, like fruit and stuff like that. Uh, we sent a few of those knives off to different people of different backgrounds. Yeah, all over. And the feedback we started getting from them, as far as, you know functional carryable knife that looks like a kitchen knife or utility knife doesn't look like something murdery for per se you know and uh yeah that's it's it's yeah. been a trip and i think that was like the cool thing about that project was just that we had done so many iterations like we didn't rush into it like we didn't have a deadline to say like oh we want this out in two months it was like let's take as long as it takes to make a knife that is exactly what we both want for yeah. it. So like, let's make it the right shape. Let's make it the right materials. We tried different materials for the handles. We tried different materials for the blades, different grind angles. And like, we just let people test it. Like our friends and people we trust and things like that. And I think that's what made it pretty successful is just the fact that we took that iterative approach and didn't just rush into like, hey, we want to make this just to make it. And so yeah. now, I mean, it's been hugely successful and been a really fun thing to be part of. And, uh, I think a lot of people appreciate it. Yeah, and uh, you know, Copus as a company has grown. You know, yeah. since I met you, I don't still remember. nights and weekends, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's uh, it's like I've seen the pro your product offerings uh, expand. Yeah, I've seen uh, I've seen you. Uh, you know, I'm not going to take credit for the influence that, that uh, maybe I, I have had on your life, but uh, I've seen you take uh, some of the experiences you've gotten at classes and some yeah. of the interactions we've had with you know, makers will come to these classes yep. and just test their things and have the openness in the community around uh, some of the training that, that, that we provide. And you've expanded, you know, the products that you offer. Uh, a lot of the products that we offer now, especially like, so like, obviously we started work, like working with Matt Martin of VM and Knives. It was like all customs. He makes super high end stuff that Beautiful honestly, stuff. someday I probably won't even ever be able to make his like level of things. But that aside, like he taught me how to like put the quality into things and the form fit and function and how to learn how to like uh, figure out the right ergonomics. But then through the classes and you and the people that we've met through you, that's when we've tried started to expand into like actually distributing things that we use. So yeah. like when we use something in the class and we know it's good this, and people are like, is, yeah, yeah. people are like, cool oh, I can't get it. How can I get it? And it's like, this, all right, well now we're, we're starting to work with other people that are like, hey, we make cool stuff. You make cool stuff. How can we make this a collaboration and work yeah. on that? And so like, it, that's it, a big expansion for us is like actually being able to provide tools that we don't necessarily even make, but yeah. that we use. Yeah. Or something you encounter that's, oh, this is cool. I wish somebody made this now. Yeah. You know, like this. Uh, all the old things that you and I yeah. found at like thrift stores and like when we go yeah. to the antique well, stores. Or, like, like I, so, you know, I can't make shit, you know, I can sharpen stuff on the ground. I'll make something out of duct tape and cardboard and shit like that. But uh, we bought this uh, like a hundred year old corkscrew yeah. that will ex expand. I said, I said, hey, can you make this? I'm like, I'll figure it out. Yeah, well, that's actually still on my like. So I literally have like a whiteboard of like projects I still want to do. Yeah. And that one's on there for sure. Yeah. And so I think like as like obviously for those of you that haven't seen like the shop is in disarray. We're in a brand new shop right now. We just moved in about a month ago and we're still setting it up. So, but the point being is like it's a really cool opportunity now that we have this space to actually bring in the machines that we want to start expanding our production beyond just the handmade stuff. Because obviously up until now everything's been like. We grind it on the grinder, drill press, but nothing like high tech, CNC, anything like that. But we've had the ability to do it for a while. But now that we have the space, hopefully we can start expanding into 
making some of the things that we like and use or want to make different. And I think like things like the corkscrew we talked yeah. about, like that's like up on my whiteboard of possible projects. Now, like for people watching this and, uh, you know, I'm, and a lot of them are probably in the EDC community or people that like knives. Some, like, books, some, yeah. some of them are not, you know? Yeah. And every now and then I get questions like, Ed, what type of knife would you recommend? Like, what would you get? Like, what if you wanted something quality, what would you buy? And I'm, I'm never going to sell myself or sell stuff. But like, what would you say to somebody that wants to buy a daily carry knife, uh, a quality daily carry knife that, uh, you know, won't maybe won't break the bank, but it's something that he would carry with him uh, for a while, blade-wise, style-wise, uh, steel-wise? What would you recommend for somebody like that? I mean, like, I, 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 I don't know if it's a canned answer because I've answered it for a long time the same way, but it's basically like, the best knife is the one you carry. So like, I don't, like there are brands I love and makers that I would say like, if you want a knife from them, they're gonna be amazing no matter what you buy. But at the end of the day, it's what are you gonna actually have on your person the most? So like, if you like big knives, go for a big knife. If you like small, small knives, go for a small knife. If you have training, use a knife that fits with your training. But like at the end of the day, it's what knife is going to be in your pocket or on your person at all times that you're actually gonna use. Whether it's for cutting a seatbelt when someone's stranded in a car or peeling an apple. Like whatever it is, is like, to me, that's the best knife. I think there are some things to stay away from, like poor quality materials, things that are obviously gimmicky. But like once you get into the level of like, quality steel, quality handles, quality hardware, made from someone that is somewhat reputable. I think that like it's not a matter of money. It's like you, I can get a $20 knife at Walmart that I'd be fine with for a week in the woods. You know what I yeah. mean? Uh, folder versus fixed. I am personally a fixed guy, always a fixed, even if it's a small one but I always have a folder on me as well. Yeah. So like redundancy yeah. wise, like it, especially like in public, if I'm like opening a box, like I don't want to pull out a fixed blade and people get weirded out. So sometimes there'll be a small folder, like even if it's like a little Swiss army knife or something. But I personally believe as far as my own philosophy of carry is I always have a fixed blade on me or yeah. in my pack or something like that. And then I'll carry something more small, nondescript for a folder to like, use for things that yeah. don't draw attention. How about uh, steel? Like, okay, uh, yeah. because, you know, we, I don't, I'm not gonna say we have some nerds following. Yeah, so we yeah, probably no. have some steel nerds. Uh, oh, I mean, honestly, a lot of these people out there probably know them more than I do. I, I stick to a, a certain group of steels. So like, I have no problem with carbon steel. I think they have a great um, use case for knives that need to have a really fine edge, not necessarily have the best edge retention in the world because they're maybe used by a chef or something like that. Or if you wanna have a carbon steel for a chopper or an ax, like 3V, that stuff works great. All good things. I personally, for myself, I like stainless steel. I usually carry my knives close to the body. If I'm sweating, I'm fat, yeah. you know, like sweating, like whatever, drop it in water. I like stainless personally. I have nothing against carbon steel. I think there's great use for it, but I don't like oiling my knives. So like, that's another thing. Like I wanna use my knife when I need to use it. I'll rinse it off, wipe it with a towel. Maybe if I have oil, I'll throw it on there. But, um, <coughs> and then I would say for me, I like to stick towards the mid range um, just because field expedient sharpening is a thing for me. Yeah, yeah. So like when you get into the super steels, like I won't even name them because everyone's gonna make fun of me because I don't know the newest whatever it is, but there's always every year at Blade Show the new crazy powdered laser centered steel and it's awesome. Holds an edge forever, but as soon as the edge is gone, without the proper equipment, there's no way to sharpen it. Yeah, that's, that's always an issue, yeah. So like I like, I mean like CPM 154 to me is ideal. Like, not a super steel, not a low range, stainless, good edge retention. You can sharpen it in the field with very little stuff. You strop it every now and then, doesn't need to be ground. That's what I like. That's awesome. I, for me, being able to sharpen my own shit, uh, being able to maintain my own shit, like, that is essential for me. And, uh, you know, anybody that hasn't had the need to sharpen something in the field probably has a shit ton of knives and uses a lot of them and just fucking leaves them yeah. behind when they're not sharp. I usually, I've been carrying around the same blade for about eight years now. And that's like mostly the one I carry every day. Uh, when I travel, you have to kind of like mindset wise, you might not be able to travel with your specific blade because of yeah. legalities and size like that. So that's when usually something smaller comes into play, you know? But I usually focus on kind of the same style of knife some, and same blade. And again, one of the things that I always look for is being able to sharpen it myself or just do any field expedient shit with it. That's, yeah. a, that's a pretty good answer. Um, 
I want to get into knife making. Okay. Uh, I see all, all these guys doing knives. I see your stuff. Like, I could probably make that. You, you probably know? could. Uh, take some time. It takes some time. Uh, what's your advice for somebody who wants to get started in this whole uh, knife making uh, process? So for me, like, honestly, like, this is, like, a luxury that I had. But, like... Um, I come from, like, a family where, like, learning from someone else that has more experience is, like, a very important thing, Mentorship. Right? Yeah. And so, like, if you don't have that ability, there's a lot of good resources online. Like, I've met, actually, makers at Blade Show that I would consider phenomenal, right up there with me that had no training or anything like that, but just naturally dexterous. They're willing to put in the time and the research, but for me, at least, th there's no replacement for, like, actually having an apprenticeship. So putting in the time with... A person or a company that you trust and you respect and being able to like learn the basics right off the bat and have those skills instilled sure. the other thing i'd say that's a combination with that is like that's one part of it but you also have to have some natural skills yourself so like know the difference between like a wrench and pliers because like when you get in the shop and you're an apprentice you don't want to have to be learning that stuff yeah. so like get yourself familiar with tools in general work with wood like carving, whatever it is, work with other materials, whether it be plastics, you know, like try and get yourself dexterous and working on, like if you work on a truck or work on your car, you're probably going to be d better at making knives than someone who only works on a computer. But design is a big part of it too. So like having an artistic ability, I think is a part, but first advice would be try and find someone who knows what they're doing, pick their brains. Even if they're willing to just give you an hour or two of like, here's the equipment that you need, like bare minimum, like you can go to Harbor Freight, get a hundred dollars worth of stuff and start. Yeah, so like, what's what's your what's your uh, shopping list for the, the starting kit? Starting kit? Like, let's say, I mean, the starting kit, if you want to do it right, is going to be very different than this. But, like, if you literally only had a couple hundred bucks and you wanted to go to Home Depot or Harbor Freight, is get, like, a 1x30 grinder with a couple different belts. That's, like, the first thing. Get yourself an actual, like, regular rotary grinder, like a tabletop one, maybe a bandsaw, and then get some materials and start playing. Like, and from there, you can get pretty close. Maybe a 4x36 flat sander if you want to get fancy. Yeah. But, like, I've known makers, like, even, like, makers that I've learned from and have mentored me that started with a 4x36 flat sander, like, made for wood. And they made knives on it. Like, knives that are, like, legit knives. Like, very good. Um, other thing is, like, if you're going to heat treat yourself, be careful and like make sure that if this knife is going to someone that needs it, like that's one thing I'm very careful about is heat treat is like, so for me, knives going to people that actually need it. Yeah. Heat treat is one thing that you can't fuck around with. Like you really got to either know what you're doing or use someone that does. Because like if someone's life is going to be on the balance on this knife, there's no way you can check for inclusions, cracks or anything like that without like x-ray, liquid penetrant testing. And that all gets really expensive. So if you're making the knife to make the knife, Make sure people know what they're getting into. Like, don't purport that your knife is like the best, most tactical knife if you know you don't know that it can actually perform that way. That's great advice. That'd be um, one of the things. So, where can people learn more about your company and the work you do? Sure. So, like, uh, obviously, probably Instagram is the best one. Just uh, at Copus Designs. We also have our website, CopusDesigns.com. Um, you can check us out pretty much anywhere else, but I mean, at the end of the day, like we're really in it for the community. Like I I've told people this and it sounds cheesy, but like at the end of the day, like this is nights and weekends for us and everyone that helps me is a volunteer. So like my brother, my apprentice, uh, Morgan, my partner, like we we're all just doing this because we love the community. We love knives and we like meeting new people. And that's been like probably in my opinion, what's expanded my boundaries and my horizons so much is just the people we've met through doing this kind of thing. So like... And then the the plan long term is to do this full time at some point. So not ready yet, but we're looking into it, like I we've think, talked about. I think you're well on your way. Yeah, we're getting there. Uh, thank you for inviting us to no, your shop. No, thank you. Always a pleasure. Like I said, I mean, like we've hung out here at the houses, the various houses over the years, and now we yeah. have the new one. So it's been nice being able to do this. And I think you've been out to Denver probably eight or nine, ten times now. I yes. travel so much that I yeah. just I, every now and then I wake up. I don't know where I am. Yeah. But uh, again, thank you for your for letting us in. Thank you for showing us around and awesome work. Yeah, looking forward to the next stuff, man. Uh, thanks, thanks, everyone. Guys.